Welcome back to the Restaurant Technology Guys. I thank everyone out there for joining us. I'm excited about today's show because I've got a couple on. I'm going to let them introduce themselves here in just a second. Funny enough, the brand that they started with has been on the show one time before. Those longtime listeners, probably about two years ago, co-founder was on. But why don't, Michelle, why don't you lead us off with introducing yourself and then you can introduce your partner in life and in business. And, and then we can get to talking about, about what you guys get to do for a living, both at, at the coffee shop and then your guys' new passion project. Great. Thank you. My name is Michelle Fish. I am the co-founder of One Big Island in Space, which is the project we're really here to talk about. And my handsome husband, Robert Fish, uh, is the co-founder of Big B Coffee. Yeah. And I don't go anything as formal as Robert. Uh, I was like, um, Robert, that's the first time I've heard yeah. this. Who's that guy? <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, Mike and I started Big B Coffee in 1995. We started franchising in 1999. Today, we have just under 400 units in 13 states. We're pretty sure we'll be to 1,000 units by 2028. Things are really rocking and rolling there. But in 2018, after doing a lot of research, I discovered that, that actually coffee, coffee that, that has to grow and that we buy, is under threat and it's under threat for two major reasons. One is climate change. And so because of the consequences of climate change where wet areas get wetter and dry areas get drier, there's a lot of coffee farms that are failing out there and people are walking away from their farms. And then the other thing that is putting coffee at threat is the sea contract or the commodities marketplace, how that functions out there is such that often the coffee farmer, the coffee producer gets paid less than what it costs them to produce their coffee. And, and anybody that's been in business knows that you can only do that for so long, and then you can't be in business anymore. Farming is a business after all. And so again, people are just walking away from their farms. And, and this is an epidemic of people leaving the coffee production um, industry. We decided to create one big island in space. We spelled big with two G's, by the way. And what we decided to do in order to solve that problem, because we were running this business that is a retail cafe. Mm -hmm. And oh, by the way, coffee is really important to, to that business model. How do we secure coffee for the future? What we decided was that we create a direct trade model. Now we call that farm direct. And what a direct trade model does is it allows an end user like us to buy directly from a producer and eliminate as many of the people in the middle as possible. And some of those people in the middle are nefarious. Some of those people in the middle are unnecessary. Every time that coffee touches another hand, the price goes up a little bit more. So when we eliminate those, we get a savings. And what we do with that savings is push it down to the producer or the farmer. And what that does for them is make it more economically viable for them. And they can begin to adopt practices that cost money, agronomy practices, farming practices that can actually combat climate change. In other words, there are different varieties of coffee. There are different ways to farm, even though wet areas are getting wetter and dry areas are getting drier. So what we've done is create a model where we can have a secure supply of coffee at a really stable price. And that's what we've done for our owner operators, our franchisees. And we think by working on this particular model and creating these relationships that we are creating essentially a competitive moat around our business. It may not be visible today, but in, in, not, in, in not too distant future, that will be a distinct competitive advantage. Now, we only work with certain kinds of people and the kinds of people we work with from a farming perspective are people that are already treating their people. So something that's what we would say is beyond fair trade. We work with people that are treating the planet right. And, and from that perspective, we would say something beyond USDA organic. In other words, our regenerative methods of farming. And then finally, we work with people that are investing in their community. And that's a little bit like finding a needle in a haystack when you have to find coffee producers that, that, are, that, that exist around the world. By the way, and I'll pass it off at, at the end of this little note here, coffee grows all over the world at altitude between the Tropic of Cancer and Capricorn, equidescent from the equator. 
So it grows in Central and South America, it grows in Africa, and it grows in Asia. And so we visit these communities looking for these people. I, I, that was a lot and fantastic. <laughs> I said it at the onset, though, Bob, I'd love for those that are less familiar with the cafes, can you just give us a, 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 a quick history lesson? And then I can't wait to, to talk to Michelle about to the inception of this, of where this came from. But for those that are less familiar with the cafes, I was privileged enough and those that heard me talk to your co-founder a couple of years ago. And again, I'm I, admittedly not a huge coffee fan, but I do love enjoying the atmosphere, having another type of beverage, maybe something to eat in cafes all over the place. And so talk to me a little bit about what is Big B Coffee for people that haven't experienced it or haven't haven't been into one of your guys' cafes, because I do think it's I do think it's critical to understand why you guys are so passionate, not just about the cafes and what they do and your franchisees, but it really is a thread that I've seen every time I've engaged with your brand that I think our listeners need to understand. Yeah, our cafes are, are really a, a people-centric place in a community-centric place. Our cafes are colorful, they're active, they're bright, they're unassuming, and they, they are generous. They are all those things. That's how we identify them. This idea of being people-centric, a core to our business, our mission, or rather our, our purpose in business is to support people in building a life they love. And we follow the, the stakeholder model of business. So when we say that we support you in building a life you love, we're not just talking about our home office or our owner operators or their baristas or the customers. We're talking about everybody, including vendors and all the families associated with that. And our vision by 2028 for Big B Confi is to improve workplace culture in America. So we think that in our business model of serving coffee, embedded in that is uh, part of the model is to demonstrate that the workplace can be a regenerative place for people. The, our society is, is ripe with anxiety and stress and both financial and emotional and so on, uh, you spend uh, eight hours a day at work, 40 hours a, a week. Uh, it's a place that we can have an impact uh, on this world. And we think that's really important. Well, thanks for sharing. And I think, uh, again, for those that haven't gotten a chance to, to get into one of the cafes, I would encourage you guys. And I know that, uh, I don't know, some very large percentage of the world does drink coffee. And so for, uh, I know I'm in the minority. I get it. Everybody shames me for it. Funny enough, uh, and I, I think I told Mike this, this story, we got a chance to go to the big coffee brand that happens to be in the Pacific North, Northwest one time. And uh, since I don't drink coffee, but they've got a whole bar of I don't know, 40 different kinds of coffee from all around the world. And my line is, I've had my limit for the day, which to coffee drinkers, I guess, means something. Because you just, but I'm like, you know what? My limit is zero. So I just had my limit for the day when I went in there, <laughs> when they offered me the coffee, because it was a bit easier to do that than it was to say, I'm sorry, I don't drink coffee. And they probably would have kicked me out when I had that appointment. Michelle, talk to me a little bit about where does this passion project come from? Because I, I got to listen to Bob talk about that. And you can see both of your guys' eyes light up when you guys talk about a world that's better. But talk to me, actually, talk to me first about the name. And then let's talk about where this thread comes from, because you know what? It's encouraging to see people in business because I'm like-minded business owner that I love, love and have passion to see people succeed, part of our core values. And But I love that that you guys are taking it beyond just your team members and just the cafes. And so talk to me a little bit, where's the name come from first? And then let's talk a little bit about how and where did we get to this point? Keeping in mind that coffee has grown literally all around the world, as Bob described. Uh, one, one central tenet that we feel very strongly about is uh, people are people. Wherever you go, we all want the same things. We want uh, safety, security, health. We want a better life for our children. And Bob was inspired by that picture that they took. I think it's called Moonrise. It was the first picture of Earth ever taken from space by the astronauts. And when you look at that picture, you do not see maps. You don't see grids. You don't see borders. You just see this beautiful blue marble spinning in space. And you look around and we don't see any other beautiful blue marbles spinning in space, at least not in our solar system. We are truly one big island in space and all of us are connected to each other. And we have way more in common than we ever have different between us. So that was a guiding philosophy in how we started to approach the work we're doing in coffee. 
our first experience, we were invited to go to an orphanage in Zambia that had started a coffee farm because coffee can grow in Zambia to make itself more, more sustainable. And they weren't growing very much coffee, about 20,000 pounds a year, but they were having, they were really having trouble finding a marketplace for it. And we went and we saw the power of what they were doing, the way they empowered the people that were actually farming the coffee and the way that as an economic uh, engine was really changing lives for the, the people in Andola. But also then the profits from that coffee were supporting this orphanage that's doing an incredible work. Mm -hmm. And we were inspired. We were so inspired. We bought everything they hadn't sold yet <laughs> and set about trying to find other coffee producers in the world that had similar values. And for us, that's the most important thing. We start with, with the values alignment mm -hmm. with the producers. There's a lot of great things happening in the world, but there's also a lot of exploitation. Yep. There's a, a lot of extraction. There's a lot of poverty that is almost imposed on the population because the conditions in which they're trying to work, particularly in any commodity. So we were looking for, at, at first, it's shifted a little since then, we were looking for mid-sized farms, and that means somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 acres to 200 acres uh, of coffee in production, trying to find those mid-sized farms that were really having an impact to the positive, both for the people that worked on the farm and for the communities that they were in, but also, and just as importantly, that they were farming in a way that takes good care of the earth. Mm -hmm. there, there are all kinds of ways to farm coffee. And the cheapest way to do it is to cut down all the trees, pollute your water streams, uh, and suck every last thing you can get out of the soil. That is the cheapest way to grow coffee. Uh, it really takes uh, both investment and intentionality to do it differently than that. Mm -hmm. And so we were trying to find those farmers that could really be a guiding light in their communities and then support them. What we bring to it is the marketplace because we sell about two point something million pounds of coffee a year. And generally speaking, a concept like Big B or like any other coffee chain would buy their coffee through a roaster. Yep. Right. So, and they not really know anything about the coffee, except that it comes from Nicaragua or they, they might even know the name of the farm, but they really don't know anything about the people that went into growing that coffee. So we want to start with the people. Mm -hmm. Which I think goes back to, again, my original inst my, my original episode a couple of years ago back with Bob's co-founder. Bob, educate me as to what coffee purchasing and distribution look like prior to this journey, because I do. There's probably a lot of listeners that are ignorant. They buy coffee every day, whether it's at the grocery store or it's at a cafe, and they have no idea what the impact to the world is. Because I think understanding what that means when they go into any brand and buy coffee that doesn't think this way, what it does, because I think it really will finish out the thought process I have around our conversation so that we can get super passionate and I can let you guys riff a little bit about why it's so important that we all consider these things. So walk me through the journey from when you guys started in the mid 90s through to when you guys truly understood the impact that you were making with the decisions that you made. I'm guessing based on the now having met you guys unintentionally, but now that you guys know it, now you have to change it. You have to change it. That's right. Yeah. I think most people think coffee comes from a roaster or, or maybe it comes <laughs> from the grocery store. Yeah. Uh, it comes from the grocery store. It comes from some place that I just walk up and order it. And it's just, the and I certainly thought the same thing. No, we existed in business all the way up to 2018 with never having set foot on a, a coffee farm or mm -hmm. understanding how it grows and so on and so forth. And uh, the way it normally works for a concept like ours is uh, you pick up the phone, you talk to a broker and the broker figures it out and it's really convenient. There's this curtain that gets pulled and you don't need to know anything about that. It, it's not important to know anything about that. But once you pull back the curtain and look in, it's a really complicated process, right? So when we say farming coffee, it takes 365 days to get a one crop of coffee. And that starts off as a cherry on a tree. It has to be picked at the perfect red moment and not all the cherries turn red at the same time. So pickers have to go through many times in about a three, four month period to just per the, pick the perfect red cherry. From there it's wet milled. And that just means that the fruit is taken off and behind is left two seeds that we call coffee beans, but it, this stage, they're relatively small and they're green. And at that point, 
They have to be dried, uh, usually on a cement bed. It could be in an oven. And it has to be dried to about 10% humidity. And then it can go to what's called dry processing. And all this is still happening in the producing country. Dry processing is where you sort through the beans and you get rid of the defects and the light ones and the misshapen ones and so on and so forth. And then in the end, you have this quality green product that's graded using something that's called the Q grade within the specialty coffee industry. And so it'll be assigned a number in terms of its taste value. Then it has to be put in uh, burlap bags. I think almost everybody knows that coffee is packed in burlap bags and stored for a moment in the producing country, but eventually ends up on a boat, comes to the consuming country like the United States or Europe or whatever, gets offloaded, put on a warehouse. And that's where a broker is waiting for your phone call, typically speaking. Then it has to end up on a truck, go to a roaster, get roasted, get packaged, and then get delivered either to a retail grocery outlet or a retailer cafe like ours to be sold or produced. It's a very lengthy, cumbersome process. And when we go farm direct, there's all these bits and pieces in the middle that we have to figure out Mm. instead of using a broker to do that. But in the figuring out, you figure out that there's people that are unnecessary in that process. And then there's some people that are nefarious in that process. In other words, they might take advantage of the producer. And our ultimate goal is to make sure that producer is economically viable to the degree that they can support their family and send their kids to school and contribute to their community. I love that. Michelle, you talked a little bit about your your guys' passion and the core values fit. Talk to me a little bit about what that means for those that might not understand when you guys are picking providers for this, these products that, that I've just talked about is what does that mean? How do you guys figure those things out? Cause having been overseas, I've been, we talked a little bit pre-show. I have a son who's from Africa. I've been to some of these places. I've been to parts of Mexico and parts of Central America. I've seen the things you're talking about, Bob. I've seen the nefarious people going through the adoption process. There were people that I knew were on the take and I was watching. You watch it and you're like, oh, that guy is probably on the take. And it's tough to watch because you're dealing with human lives. And I love that you guys are so passionate about creating a better life for them because they have all of the tools. They just need somebody to support them and, and cut all of the crap out that's been holding them down for so long. But what does that mean to have a core values fit, Michelle? The way we find these producers is changing over time. We've been doing this for five years now. But one thing that doesn't change is it always starts with a conversation. And sometimes that's complicated mm-hmm. because you need translators. And You need to make um, sure they're not on the take, too, because sometimes they might tell you what you want to hear because they've it, got some ulterior but, motive, which is hard. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you absolutely. off, but I think it's true. No, that's really true. And we're pretty fortunate when the other language is Spanish. We have, as we've built our team, we have some very close partners in Central and South America that can really help us vet out other partners when we're in these conversations. But it it starts with Zoom calls and emails, and we check out their website and they check out our website. We have lots and lots of discussion. And if we really think there's something there, um, it it doesn't start to become real until we go. Mm -hmm. A key component of the way we do this work is something we call boots on the ground. We might visit a farm And we stay on the farm and we stay for four or five days. We might visit that farm five times before we actually, before we we're able to come around to being able to craft a partnership. And in that, when you're walking those fields with the farmers and you're sharing every meal, there's a lot that unfolds Mm. that you don't get from the conversations, although the conversations are a really important first step. It's really been a journey for us. So we learn something from every farm we visit. And we visit many, and we currently only have four partnerships. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot more no's in our world than there are yeses. But the truth of what's happening on the farm unfolds on the farm. Well, I'm um, going I'm, I'm to throw this question at you both, which is oftentimes, and again, having lived some ministry worlds around the globe, there are times that people will tell you what you want to hear because sure. they realize that, that. And the other piece is, is oftentimes when you're going in with a crazy idea, I'm not saying it's crazy in a bad way, but it's a very different business model. Oftentimes people are skeptical and or they don't believe. Talk to me a little bit about how you guys have overcome that because that's hard. That's hard to change a culture altogether. And you guys are already, you guys already have this huge BHAG about changing work culture in the United States, which I am, I, I am here cheering you guys on. I'm so grateful that there are people like you guys in the world that are doing that. 
And you guys are not only taking it to the U.S. and to the 400 cafes you guys have now, but now you guys are taking it to farms and in that, that the, those parts of the world where most people won't do that. So, Bob, why don't you, why don't you share a little bit about what that looks like? Because I think it's amazing. Yeah, I think what we say is we're looking for people that are treating people right, the planet right, and investing in their community. But one of the core areas where we have discovery on visiting a farm is on the planet component. So by that, we're looking for somebody that's not using herbicides and pesticides. And so when Michelle says we walk the fields, you can tell immediately, we can anyway, whether there's, they're using herbicides or whether they're slashing. And if they're using uh, pesticides, uh, we don't see butterflies, we don't see grasshoppers, we don't see frogs and so on and so forth. So there, there's some real evidence that's right there. But also we really look for regenerative farming. And so what that means is there's no deforestation or there's an effort to reforest that the, the byproduct, this pulp that comes off the coffee can pollute the water, that there's a, that there's a composting program in place and in effect and, and so on. And you can tell on the planet side whether people are taking care of the land properly, right? So now that really informs already then both the people side and the community side, right? So if and you can't you can't hide that very easily. You, you can't, can't just no, go. To, you can't just go no, throw no. a bunch of grasshoppers out and go. Hey, no, they're all here. They don't even know that they don't have them because yeah, exactly. they're living that life that way. You know, we had a very distinctive experience in Kenya where we sat in, 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 in the offices of this farm and they're certified this and that and the other and Starbucks care and all of it. And Michelle says, great, yeah, let's go to the fields. And they hitch a little bit, but they throw us in the car and they take us to the fields. And there was, there, one, one thing there isn't, like when you were manu manually managing uh, the, the, the plant material, there were always people with machetes around. That's how you, that's how you do it. There were no people with machetes, right? The dirt, there was no plant material besides the coffee. And Michelle leaned over and asked the guy, he said, are, are, you using, are you using herbicides here? And he, he hemmed and hawed and so on and so forth. And she leaned in a little bit more and he, he looked down a little bit and sheepishly said, yeah, we have to. Labor's been so high and so on and so forth. And she's, what are you using? And he stated, I'm using gypsophilate. And of course, gypsophilate is Roundup and Roundup is a known carcinogen, right? So we can't have that. So here, this place actually had the certifications that would lead you to believe that no gypsophilate is being used, but we have the experience and knowledge after having been on so many farms and been with so many people that are doing it right, that we can identify this stuff uh, pretty quickly. But I'll tell you that people that are taking care of the planet right are also generally, and of course, we investigate this as well, but are generally treating people right too. So sometimes we're looking at housing conditions. Like we've seen housing conditions for workers that you wouldn't put your dog in. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then we also look for this part about investing in the community. And that manifests itself in so many different ways. It might be about providing uh, potable water to the balance of the community. Mm -hmm. It might be providing uh, schooling for children that are working on the farm. It might be building a bridge. Uh, we don't know. Uh, we don't have any expectation. I, one thing I want to make clear, and I don't want to get too far off track, we're not looking to convert anybody to these things. We're looking simply for people that we already have this value alignment mm -hmm. with, right? And so it can become pretty obvious or not pretty quickly with a boots on the ground visit. Well, and I think even in that community aspect, you walk around the community and you can hear, you can see, you can feel what people's impression of that farm is or what that organization is. And people will say, those guys are amazing. They helped me with this medical thing when my XYZ was, or yeah. you get the opposite where they're like, yeah, people stay away from there because it's run by some this, that, or the other. I'm going to start to wrap up, but Michelle, what does the world look like as you guys continue to engage in this? I know it's not, I don't believe it's 100% of the coffee you guys sell at this point, but I believe you guys have a vision that you guys are going to get to that place. Talk to me a little bit about what does the future look like and, and how has the journey been over the last five years and how long do you guys think it's going to take to get there? Our goal is to be 100% Farm Direct by 2028. And that's a little misleading in a way because Big B continues to grow at this very robust rate. So the amount of coffee we need to find is it's more every year. So we're chasing pretty hard. 
but I, I believe that we'll get there. And when we get there, we'll probably be selling in the neighborhood of four to five million pounds. Big B will be a thousand unit chain. And we will have a bigger soapbox to be able to stand up and talk to the industry broadly about, about what's not working for coffee, because we all know it. Mm -hmm. And we'll be able to point out some of the shortfalls mm -hmm. of the way many others in the industry do it. Because you can do it in such a way that you maximize your own profits and it's going, but it always comes at somebody's expense. Yep. And in this case, it's the people that are behind that black curtain and it's the planet. And we don't believe that, that it's sustainable. If coffee is going to continue to grow and thrive as an industry, we're going to have to do a better job of taking care of the people that produce it. And we're definitely going to have to do a better job of taking care of the planet. As we have become, as more people know what we're up to, we're finding producers looking for us. Like they, we, we think of them as a needle in a haystack, but they definitely think of us as a I needle in a haystack. I am certain of that. And we have, we're finding more and more like-minded souls out there in the industry. We're trying to connect, connect us all together so that we're stronger together so that we can make this change happen. Because if we don't, um, you won't notice because you don't drink coffee, but I will. <laughs> yeah. 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 I will miss my daily cup. And it's, uh, it's going to, it's changing out there. And if we don't do something, we may lose it as an industry altogether. Yeah. I, one other thought I had just before we, before we wrap up and we ask our audience how they can support you guys in this journey is what, what things now that you guys are on this five-year journey, did you guys come across that you didn't expect when you guys were visiting these farms? You guys talk about the hundreds of farms you guys have had to go. What things outside of the fact that there are people and they are fantastic out there. And when you sit arm in arm across the table with people, it is amazing how cultures can get so much. People that would never have known each other can sit down and have a meal and can just change the world together. So I love that. And you guys alluded to that earlier, but what other things have you guys learned as humans, as people? Thought I understood what poverty was. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I went to Sierra Leone mm -hmm. in the R of country and it shook me profoundly to my core that there are still in this age of the world that there are people who have so few access to resources that they are they're living lives i can't i couldn't imagine before i spent time there walking those fields the depth of the challenge is so great for me anybody that's ever run a restaurant knows the craziness that happens during a meal period in a rush one of our partners, Restaurant Technologies Total Oil Management Solution, is an end-to-end -end oil management system that delivers, filters, monitors, and recycles your cooking oil, taking one of the jobs that none of your team wants to do and takes it off your hands, allowing your team members to focus on their guest. Control the kitchen chaos with uh, Restaurant Technologies and make your kitchen safer while maximizing your staff's time. The solution can be provided at no upfront costs if you want to learn more, please check out rti-inc.com or call 888-796-4997. How about you, Bob? Yeah, for me, I think it's something that I already knew, but that as human beings, although we like to categorize ourselves into these teams and countries and ethnicities and so on and so forth, but when you sit down and break bread with people, we're 99.9999% the same. Mm -hmm. And we all want the same things, right? Yep. And it's been super rewarding to humanize our own humanity and to see, touch, and feel that. I think there's nothing more rewarding than that. And one of the things that we do for our owner operators and our franchisees and others that, that, that enter our world is we bring them on these farm direct journeys, right? So we won't bring them to an initial visit, but we often bring them to our follow-up visits once the relationship is established. And the number of times that we've heard these words, quote, unquote, this has been a life-changing experience for me, is infinite. And we talk about this idea that we're just this one big island in space and that things are interdependent. But when you go see, touch, and feel it, you come to realize that profoundly. Thank you. I think that's a fantastic place to, to end, end my questioning other than how do people support the mission? How do people get involved? How do people help? How do people, again, there, there's lots of people out there. There's lots of daily coffee drinkers. People have choices every day with how they spend their time and their energy. 
So how do people engage with your guys' brand to learn more and, and engage there? So Bob, why don't, you, why don't you take it and then you can pass it to Michelle. Right now, we have a, a blend called Big B Best Blend that is 100% farm direct. And so every producer in there is a farm direct relationship. And so just simply by, by buying that coffee and making that a uh, drip coffee choice definitely supports us. But we also, we keep a blog. We are storytellers in the end. And we started the blog in 2018 and it, it, it demonstrates the journey that we've been through. It shares a lot of the ideology, but you can find that at www.onebigislandspace.com with two G's. We also have a YouTube channel that we keep with the same moniker and we have a Facebook channel with the same moniker as well. But just sharing, if you heard these words and they inspire you, if you could just share with other people about what we're up to at One Big Island in Space, that would be just most appreciated. One of our big goals is to put a name, a face, and a place on every cup of coffee we serve. Because we think that actually the people who have the power to change the world are the consumers. Mm -hmm. And once the consumer understands the connection to the people behind the coffee that they're growing, we think that they will be empowered to make stronger choices to support the work we're all doing. And you definitely get to meet many of the people. You get to see most of the places on our blog. Um, and I highly recommend you go there. Thank you guys so much for not only the cafes, but just even what you guys are trying to do to change the world. It's inspiring. And while I'm not a huge coffee drinker, I may go. That may be my coffee choice to, to send gifts out now going forward. Because again, as you guys said, once you know that it exists and it's out there, you can no longer claim ignorance that you had no idea that this cup of coffee might have impacted some child's life somewhere around the world that you may never meet or likely will never meet. But the opposite could also be true should you choose a different path. Well, thank you guys for taking time to share a bit of the story. To our listeners, guys, we know that you guys have got lots of choices. So thank you guys for spending time with us. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the newsletter and you'll get a copy of all of the shows for that month. To Bob and Michelle, thank you guys so much. And to our listeners, make it a great day.